episode of Let the Punk Talk. As always, joined by Carl from Boxing Royalty and my very special guest, good friend and former coach, Rob Lloyd Taylor. Rob, how are you doing? Yeah, good, thank you, Jackie. A good call. Good Thanks for having me on. All right, mate. Thanks for coming on. So, yeah, Rob, you obviously, I know you come from a boxing family. I know your dad was a fighter. Was your granddad a fighter as well? No. Um, on my mum's side, she had mm. boxers on, on um, her side. I think my granddad dabbled a little bit, but it's further back. His dad was mm. a, a boxer and a coach as well. Okay. I, I, I've, got, I've, I've got a picture somewhere. I've, I've lost it in the house somewhere in the, yeah. the valleys in Wales with oh. the, my great granddad and the boxing team. Oh, nice. <laughs> mm. So is that like how, that was that kind of like your route into boxing because you come from like a family of boxers? No, I don't know. I just, no, I grew up boisterous. I just, you know, we grew mm. up on Bruce Lee movies. Yeah. Um, so I, I just used to love it. I, yeah. I knew my dad was a boxer as well. So mm. yeah, I just kind of uh, born into it and brought up on it really. Okay, nice. And what, what club did you box for when you were an amateur? I boxed for a hand in West London. And how many amateurs did you have? I had eight amateurs. Did you enter any competitions or anything as an amateur? No, I was meant to go into the novices, but they never put me in. And then that's mm. after that's when I turned professional for, shortly after that. Okay, so why after such a short amateur career, only eight fights, did you think, yeah, I think I want to go pro? Um... I think it's my, my, my dad, really. I was let my dad guide me. Um, I had a few years out of boxing because I fractured my elbow. Mm. Um, so I, I didn't really want to waste any time. Um, I was improving and coming on. So, you know, really, I just let my dad guide me. Like, yeah. He said, let's go. So I, I went. Looking oh. back now, I think it would have been better if I did further my amateur career. Mm. Get a little bit more experience, find find my my grounding really, uh, for the amateurs rather than trying to do it in the pros. But yeah, of course. There it goes. Yeah, exactly. So, um, did you? Who did you sign with when you first turned over? Uh, Jim Evans. And so was that on? Obviously, I know this was a while ago now, and I know things were different back then. So when you first signed over, did you have to sell tickets and stuff? Yeah, it was it was different, like before the recession, because. Mm. they'd say this is your wage how many tickets do you want yeah so you you, you have a, a set wage and you would ex be expected to sell tickets but it's not like the same ticket deal as you have today mm. yeah so it probably made the, like your life a lot easier than most of the pros now yeah so it, it was more risk on the mm. promoters but after recession you know they realized they're taking on the risks and after that decided to to pass it on yeah so to speak yeah. Fair enough. So in your second fight, you took on an undefeated prospect that was 5-0. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk to me, like, what was the decision, like, the reasoning behind that and why you decided to take that fight so early on? Well, it was management. They, mm -hmm. they, they believed I could win. They sent me there. Um, it wasn't a good idea, mm -hmm. like, management-wise, but I was a fighter, like, I don't question. I, I do what I've got to do in the gym. I turn up in a fight. Uh, it's not my job to, oh, who am I fighting, this, that. My job is just to, to go and get on with it and do the job. Um, the guy was a stone heavy as well. Yeah. Uh, um, but I had a very good first round. I had him out mm. in the first round, put him down. Then the bell went. And then not having experience, um, my manager said, stick it on him. Yeah, I went out all guns blazing mm -hmm. for half a round, threw everything at him to like to his benefit. Um, to fair play to him, he weathered the storm, took it all. I uh, gassed out, and then for the rest of the yeah, it was six twos. So mm -hmm. the, the rest of the the five rounds or four rounds, it was me just covering up, trying to trying to get yeah. through, just trying to nick a few shots where I could. Mm. Fair but enough. yeah, it, it was it wasn't a uh, great matchmaking sending me down there. Okay, fair enough, mate. So yeah, as you said, like you was a fighter, you did what you needed to do, and obviously in your your career, you took a lot of a lot of away fights. Was that kind of the kind of just fighter you wanted to be? As you said, it might have been poor management. No, I, but... no that, that's that's never what I wanted. Yeah. Um. And 
yeah, look, like looking back at my career now, I can see it. My second fight it definitely had a ne negative impact mm. on my further uh, performances because uh, I always had that in the back of my mind about gassing. After that, uh, also, I, I was never training correctly. Yeah. So uh, if you ask a lot of people, every time I fought, I was always the unfittest boxer on the bill. Yeah. Like first round, I'd throw a hard shot and I'd be totally gassed. Um, it's only until I moved training team and I moved with Adam Booth where I actually really learned how mm. I should be training. Mm. And then after that is when my fitness, uh, you know, come on. But I think by that time, you know, I, I wasn't the same person that I was yeah. going through, you know, all my fights, gassing first round, having to get through the whole fight, uh, no, no energy, uh, no, no gas in tank. Mm. Um, so I think physically and mentally, I wasn't the same person as mm. when I first started. Fair, yeah, man. So, yeah, you just obviously mentioned Adam Booth there. I was going to bring that up. Like, so, yeah, you, you trained with him. And I know I think you trained alongside, like, David Hay and all that. Like, tell us, mm. like, what that experience was like, like, being with him, training with him, training with David Hay. I know you tra used to travel a bit. I think you told me stories about when you was in Spain with him and stuff. Like, what was that whole experience like? Yeah, it was, it was a brilliant experience. Uh, I learned so much from, from um, Adam, my time with him. All the different sparring partners I got to spar with. Um, I spar with David Hay, spar with mm. George Groves, mm -hmm. Chris Eubank. All the George Groves sparring partners I got to spar with. So it, it was a brilliant learning time for me. But as I say, like I, I can see now, looking back, I wasn't the same person as I was mm. when I first turned professional, you know, yeah. firing, like ready to go. No mm. matter who you tell me to fight, I, I'm, I'm ready for it. Mm. Um, and I look back now, am I disappointed? Not really, because if, if, if I'd have been successful, who knows what kind of person would have been now? Yeah. And I don't think I would be doing or if I was doing what I'm doing now, I wouldn't be doing it as effectively as what uh, I would be doing now because mm. all the experiences that I went through, the ups yeah. and downs, you know, the wins and losses, so much that I learned through my mm. career, be it, being this way rather than being a complete success, uh, yeah. it's just better, put me in a much better position to be the training manager that I am today. Yeah, of course. No, I agree with you, mate. Uh, what like you told obviously with my time where I spent with you, you used to tell me so many like cool and interesting stories, and what and a lot of people don't know this probably about you, but in my time with you, even till this day, you was like one of the best defensive fighters I've ever seen, or probably mm. the best like mm. so I've actually seen in real life. You are probably the mm. best defensive fighter I've seen, and I mm. used to watch you spar and like. It, no one could hit you it was just so effortless to you mm. and like one of the stories i remember you told me was can't remember the fella's name but you and adam booth were in um in spain i think and adam said to someone who was sparring you and he said i'll give you 10 grand if you can lay a glove on rod um rob and uh and he turned it down he said no i don't want to do it like tell yeah. us that story I, I can't remember how much money it was but he, he didn't want to <laughs> He didn't want to risk it. Um, yeah, he, he basically said, like, if you spy him, you can land the glove on him. The, the, this money is yours. Mm. But, um, yeah, he, he didn't take it up. So, <laughs> yeah, he didn't get the spy, shows. he didn't get the money. Yeah, Who, was the shows, fight, like, Who was it? Um, Game of come I, on. I, I can't remember now. <laughs> and I, I don't really want to name drop. But um, <laughs> it, he was related to, like, a, a top boxer. Nice. So, yeah, another story that I absolutely love, and I've, I've probably heard it a hundred times, and I could listen to it a hundred more times, is obviously the prize fighter story. Like, just obviously tell us the whole experience of how you got into it, and then what happened when you was in the dressing room, and so, and then obviously you fought in your first fight, Takalu, mm. I think, former yeah, world yeah. champion, and yeah. yeah, just tell us the whole story. All right, I'll try to make it short and sweet. Um, <laughs> so I kept pestering John Wishingchurch of uh, Matram to, to get me in. Uh, I was under 
Adam Booth and Dave Calder at the time. So I asked Dave to get me in and then he said, like, it's, it's closed now. They, they filled their quota of fighters. But I kept on pestering John and eventually he put me down as a reserve. And I, I hadn't actually been training, so I didn't have a trainer. So this is a big story about it as well. So I think we were three weeks out and I still didn't have a trainer. So I messaged Adam Booth again and he said, yeah, come down. So I went down to Adam. I trained three weeks with Adam. Uh, got really good sparring. George was in camp. So I got all him and his sparring partners again. Um, and then on the day, I was expecting to sit in the dressing room. Something happened and I, I, maybe I'll get called in, maybe I wouldn't. Um, JJ Bird, he fainted in the dressing room. I think it was like 25 minutes ago before the show went ahead. Mm -hmm. So they rushed in, they tossed the coin. I believe I let the guy choose and he chose wrong. He said, I, I got my, um, I got my bringings that way. Uh, it's 25 minutes before the show started. So I had to quickly wrap my hands and, um, and I did have a trainer as well. Adam wasn't well that day. So I just went and, uh, Mick Williams, the cup guy, he come down to give me a hand. So I wrapped my hands quickly. And that day, they, they changed the format. So they take all the fighters into the ring and they pull the names out of the hat then. So literally 20 minutes, I managed to wrap my hands, get dressed, then I had to go into the ring. So I didn't have a chance to warm up. And then my name got pulled out of the hat second with uh, Takaloo. So then we had to stay in the ring. No warming up. We just had to go shake with Takaloo. And Takaloo is someone that I, I've loved watching over the years. He he was a really good fighter. Uh, Jim McDonald helped check, uh, turn his career around. And I got him in the, the my first fight. He was the favourite to win, I believe. I was 25 to, to 1 to win the, mm -hmm. the tournament. Um, I won that. Then I got the second tournament favourite in my second fight. Won that. And then I got... Um, Scott Quigg in the final and got the three wins and won. Hmm. Yeah, mate, that is just such an amazing story. Now I could yeah. listen, listen to you tell three, it. Three weeks training. Three weeks, yeah, exactly. Three yeah. weeks training and everything. It's just amazing. Now, mate. Are you Scott Quigg as in the Scott Quigg, right? No, Nick Quigg, Nick Quigg, sorry. Oh, Nick Quigg, I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. How, how does that do you mentally, obviously? Like Jack said, you're sitting there half an hour before... And you're thinking the the likelihood of me fighting is minimal. Yeah. And then, twenty six minutes later, brilliant! I've got a, world, a, a former world champion that I look yeah. up to. What are you thinking when that when the ref tells you touch gloves? You've not got your trainer. Mm. Are you just standing there thinking I've just got to take this guy out or what? Not like if, if you see me like I'm laid back anyway. So like. I'm not one who, who suffers with, with nerves or anxiety or anything. So for me, it's just, you know, a normal day's work. If you watch it back, you see them always sound like when I'm in the corner, it just looks like like I'm going to holler at something. Like, th that that's just me. I've always been that way. So it just took it in my stride, really. Mm. Nice one, Rob. So, yeah, like, <clears throat> obviously you won the prize fighter and then one would expect like big things would come for you. And obviously mm. I know you, you had your, you had one fight after and then you fought, I think it's Dunn Green and, uh, Green. yeah, yeah, Dwayne Green. And, uh, yeah. and I remember you got your friend, Carl ref that fight. Um, the one that ref my fight with Rick C Comey. Mm. Kieran McCann. Yeah. 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 You're me. Absolute helmet. <laughs> Worst I've ever met. And I know, and I know obviously you said to no me, Rob, that you thought you won that fight quite mm. easily and mm. it got given to him. And then, and then, obviously, the title fights never come for you, uh, even though you was. I think you were promised the British at one stage, wasn't you? Well, I got offered um, off the back of Price fight. I showed off. They offered me Lee Purdy for the British mm. title at, at welterweight. Mm. Um, so I accepted. At the time, I was working for British Gas, and I was on the winter roster, so I was working like eight till six every day. Um, so training wasn't easy, but I agreed with work. They'd give me like I think it's three or four weeks off unpaid leave once the fight was agreed. Um, I kept on pestering John as the fight being agreed, as the fight being agreed, and I think it is three weeks out and it hadn't been agreed. 
And Adam said to me, "Just nah, it's not time to prepare." So, mm. yeah, of course. Look, looking back now, I I should have just you know sod it, given the time. Let me just put everything into it. But it wasn't to be. Then I got offered Brian Rose for the British at Light Middle. It it wasn't a great deal, but I accepted it because it was a British title. Mm. I did take work time off of work for that, so I didn't get paid. And all just to find out he was boxing, um, is it Chris Colshaw, I think, Scottish mm. guy. So again, I, I just thought, so I, did. I, went, I just went back to work and stopped boxing for a while. Yeah. And obviously, I, I guess the frustration of not getting title shots that you mm -hmm. did deserve at that point was the reason for you retiring. Yeah, yeah. I had been offered title fights before. Like I got offered um English title against uh, mm. Michael Jennings, which was set. I think it's for Manchester. Mm. And they postponed it because they put Ricky Hatton on the bill. Mm. And then um, I think they called me up with like 10 days like notice to say, yeah, it's back on again. It's like, what am I going to do with 10 days? Yeah, of course. So, and then obviously I know you went into being a trainer and a manager and I think a promoter as well after that. Um, mm. it, was that something you always envisioned yourself, like after boxing, I want to take other fighters under my wing? Yeah, I've, I've always known that I'd um, <clears throat> remain in sport, like as a trainer, uh, potentially a manager, not a promoter. Uh, the management and the promoting was just a, a means to an end, like to try and keep all my boys busy. Mm. So it's not that I want to do it. I just see, like... I had to do it for my boys, for the people I'm working for. Mm. Now I've got to give them the best opportunities, give them the shows locally. So tickets is easier to sell mm. rather than like one being in Mainhead, one being a Slough, and they've got to sell tickets in your call. So mm. just to make it that bit easier and, you know, build it locally. Yeah. I just went down that route. Yeah. And, and, I've, always, and I've always said this to you, Rob. I always think like whatever you put your mind to I, I believe that you'll succeed at it because I've been around you and I know what you like and I know what you're like and like I know how you I know your mentality and you're and on top of that a lot of people who don't know you obviously you're like you're just such a you know like a lovely man to be around like you really look after your fighters and like obviously mm. you really looked after me when I was in a mm. in a bad place you, you invited me into your home and let you meet meet mm. my fat your family mm. you took me away on holiday like um you actually give me that sounds a bit weird <laughs> <laughs> you, you 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 gave me a chance like in my life when i had my anxiety and stuff my yeah. it all started from flying and that was mm. like kind of like the final hurdle in my life i needed to get over and yeah. you gave me that chance like mm. to come away on my first ever lads holiday with you and your friends and you know you took me around your hometown home country and like you know it, it was just an amazing experience and i think like that is th these are the kind of you're almost like a father figure to to all your fighters and it, and it's something in my life that i'm i'll be forever grateful for you for you know mm. it, it helped me out so much with everything it changed me as a person mm. and you've you've introduced me to loads of amazing people you've got so many amazing people around you like and even to this day like if anyone ever says to me Oh, I'm looking for a coach. You're you're the first name that I always put forward. You know, go see Rob. Like he's a great man. He 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 look after you. It, everything and uh, you know I speak I speak about you all the time, Rob. To my mm. to my girlfriends, like mm. I always say, I really want you to meet Rob. Like um, mm. yeah, like so people don't know. Like whatever happens in life, Rob, I always consider you a friend because you helped me out so much in my life. That's kind words, Jackie. I appreciate it. <laughs> no worries, mate. So, yeah, and um, obviously now you've, uh, I think you've taken over Paddy Fitzpatrick's stable. Is that right? No, we, we, I started going down there to to see how we gel, mm. um, with the the idea that they'd be coming down to me, and then, you know, logistics and stuff. Not everyone, you know is in position to be able to, to be traveling mm. back and forward like that um so a couple of them stopped boxing yeah um i think the traveling was too much as some like the, co the commitment wasn't there so um i still got bradley townsend mm. um he's oxford way he's been uh commuting in 
he he's been doing really well. <clears throat> I believe we we've gelled and worked really well together. I think his two performances with me have been really good. Um, I think everyone's seen the change in for the, the positive. Um, so yeah, he's good. Good. Bradley Townsend. He's ten and zero now. Mm. We've moved him down to light welterweight from welter, where he's much much stronger. He makes weight comfortably, nice. and I believe he'll be fighting for titles hopefully by the end of the year. Yeah. Okay. And I nice. think he can make a big impact. Yeah. And I know you've, what other fighters are you working with at, mo at the moment? Because when I was training with you, I know you had Ryan, who's retired. You had mm. uh, Lewis, who was a good, light, really good light heavyweight. Aaron yeah. Sinclair, Fuad. You had Mitchell, Preedy. You had Jez mm. Smith. And like you've worked with other fighters. Who, who else mm. have you got in your stable at the moment? Um, we're quiet now. Um, Ryan Walsh, I, I, I always thought he's going to be the dark horse out of the, mm. the bunch. Um, he had a star what was really entertaining to watch, mm. but he does really good like with his business. So we mm. had a chat, and I thought it's best for him to pursue his work as opposed to the boxing, because you can't serve two masters. You you got um, a business like that going, you're not taken away from the business to put into the boxing. Yeah, but not say you can do half-hearted. Mm. So. You know, he, he was on the same page. So he's done his work. He's done really, really well with that. Um, same thing with Lewis. I think as well with the pandemic, like people like just started, yeah. you, know, you know, in their thoughts, they want to do it, they're not. Um, Lewis has gone self-employed now, work himself. His business is going really well. Um, it's the same thing. You, you can't build a business while being a, a professional boxer. Mm. The, the two doesn't mix. Um, box, as I say, boxes are not like an on and off thing. Mm. It's a you know continuous journey, like chasing greatness. You can't like just training camp, fight camp from fight camp. It's year round. You have got to be putting the work in. Um, Fuad, he's boxing the pirate. He's boxing next month. Um, he's been a little bit inactive. Mm. You know, we've worked with the pandemic. But I've had a chat with him as well, so he understands now. It's not that choice that he's got to make, but you can't be taken away from the boxing. So when say it happens, like if you're working and you know you're having a, a crap day, mm. you're still going to work. It's the yeah. same with boxing. You you got to turn up. You got to put in the shift. So you can't keep rubbing from the boxing like to put into. The, the work or nights out this uh it's it's full time you, you've got to mm -hmm. chase greatness let's not waste your time let's not waste my time mm -hmm. yeah 100 percent mate. So oh, if you're in it, that... it. sorry so if you're in in it let's do it let's go all the yeah. way yeah 100 percent. that that was one of my biggest regrets of, of my time with you because i just like i feel like you gave me 100 percent, but at, my, at that time in my life i just wasn't really involved in boxing and I and mm. and like, I just feel like I didn't give you a hundred percent which is so mm. unlike me throughout my whole career I've always given a hundred percent to every single coach I've worked with and that's why I, at that time in my career I felt like it was right for me to step away and then when I when I wanted to come back obviously you was the first person I got in contact with mm. and then I knew that at the time you was moving down to I think hidden then you wanted to do it in your own home and all that and uh about at the time I was living in Alberton and um, my shift would have just not have allowed that. So I obviously had to step away from you, which is a shame because I felt there was still so much I could have learned from you. Mm. But I mean, all's well that ends well. I found a great coach now and mm. so on. And I'm happy with him who obviously, I think you know him a little bit, Kieran as well. Mm. So, but yeah, man, I completely agree. Like you've got to be a hundred percent in it. And I, and I, and I hope things turn around. Like I hope, Fuad gets gets his head down because he's mm. a talented lad and you worked wonders with him. I remember the like the first time I ever sparred him. Mm -hmm. And I did obviously he was he was always good, but I thought I always used to get the better of him. And then um when I come to you and joined you, I could I just saw massive, massive improvements mm. in Fuad. Like his defense was improved so much, like mm. just everything about him has improved. And yeah. and he's like eight and oh now as a pro. So I really hope, yeah, he just settles down. That that's what I take pride in. And mm. you got to remember, like the boys that I've worked with, it's not like I had a big, big reputation. So I've gone and got like Olympians. Mm. I've, I've taken 
uh, amateurs with like 50 50 records mm. and i've done good work with them so uh that's it's really helped me to you know improve my craft as well yeah um and i think that says a lot as well if you wasn't giving like 100 uh, percent, the fight that we had together you know a lot of people said it's your best performance yeah yeah and you mm. you box really well so i think that speaks uh bundles and you the magic happens when you've got both sides, you know, given 110 mm. percent trainer and manager. So it's a trainer and boxer. Mm. And if there's a team around them, everyone's got to be firing, given 100 yeah. percent. That's when the magic happens. 100 percent. And obviously um, you're you're not just a professional coach, you're an amateur coach as well. I don't yeah. know how many amateurs you have, but obviously someone that I was always around was your son, Robbie Jr. And um, yeah like tell it tell us about your amateur stable and obviously tell us about your son because i when i i could always see there was you know great potential with robbie jr and um like when he first started i know he lost his his first couple i'm not sure, not sure how many he lost in a row but now every time i see him boxing and on your story i just see yeah robbie's got another win robbie's got another win like yeah and what what does the future hold for little robbie yeah um I started out as a professional coach and then I, I had like low damage to come over. So then that's when I had to go the amateur route as well. Mm. So I could uh, serve them as well. Um, so I didn't want to train them and leave them in the hands of someone else. Um, so that's how I got to start with the, the amateurs. And Robbie, like, he's a beast. We're just trying to um, get his gym performances to match his performances on the night when he fights. Mm. Um, he's had 17 now. You, you won't believe, but he, he's got three victories out of the 17. Oh, wow. yeah. But if you see him in the gym, you put you put him with uh, professionals, like the kids are animal, he's a mm. beast. Um, as I say, we're just trying to get his performances from the gym on to, to fight night if you look at his record like a lot of them are uh, split decision losses mm. um he's got a stoppage on there there's mm. been a lot of fights where i believe he won mm. but it's gone the other way it seems like being a small club you know and uh you're not part of the clique yeah. anything close it doesn't go your way um we went up to birmingham for a fight just me and him and the kid he boxed, I believe he 16 fights and he'd, he'd lost three or four, some of that. And he's a big puncher as well. And best performance I've seen Rob put on, I had him dominating the, the three rounds. Yeah, he he caught the guy in the last round doing a silly dance. <laughs> and they, they said, Um, you know, decision like I just he, he's got it, best win, and they mm -hmm. give it the other way. And it's like, normally I keep my mouth shut because you can't say much to them, yeah. But I had to say to expect the, the inspector, that was horrible. Like for him to come all the way up from London and get that, horrible. Mm. And she agreed. Yeah. But yeah. what's going to happen? Yeah, exactly. That's just the thing, man. It, I mean, we all know that there's a massive problem in boxing and people taking away fights and not getting decisions. It's just, it's just one of them. But, you know, as long as Robbie just puts it to the back of his head and just cracks mm. on and just knuckles down, like, you yeah. know, he, I mean, as I said, I've been around him, like, mm. and, I, and I've been around you. I know you're a great coach, yeah. and I know Robbie's a good fighter. And like, if he just knuckles down and just gets gets the experience under his belt, like traveling mm. up to Birmingham, it must have been a great experience for him. If he just yeah. keeps on cracking away, yeah, and not not worrying about his record and the losses, like, it would just no, do him he... well. So, Rob, in an in an ideal world, when would you like little Robbie to turn over? Just when he finds his feet, you know, and he's showing the performances, what, how, what he shows in the gym on fight night. Once he, he does that and a few more fights, I'll, mm. I'll be happy for him to go. Nice, man. So, yeah, Rob, that's all from me. So I'll just hand you over to Carl now. I'm sure he's got some questions for you. So, Carl, take the I'll tell you another amateur I've got. Sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll go on. Interrupt. Uh, I was, I'm working. You know, I'm a heating engineer. Mm. So I was working around son's house and I see a pair of boxing boots. So I said to the lady, who's the boxing boots? She said, oh, that's my son. He's just started boxing. So I said, yeah, yeah, like I, I do boxing. I showed some of my bits and she took my number 
and then I, I left and I thought flipping heck it's like it's not a want like I don't really want any more amateurs I'm only serving the guys I've got now mm. um anyway he he contacted me further down the line and I thought I have to be uh true to my word so mm. I said no problem come down come down if you see him when you come through the door this little nerd like glasses <laughs> I thought frig's sake but he came in he, he done really well I tell you what, if, if you see this kid, he's so unassuming, you wouldn't feel anything of him. Mm. But he's an absolute beast. Mm. He's so physically strong. He hits so hard. His mentality, he, he just wants to fight. If you hit him, he tries even harder. And te- he's, he's been training about a year now, but technically he, he's getting better and better. Mm. And I, I honestly believe he will go all the way. Really? Like, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think I've might have seen him on your story, but yeah, like fair play yeah. to him, man. Looks can be deceiving. He looks a bit like Ricky Hatton as well. Oh, does he? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But well, he's got glasses like Clark Kent. Yeah. When you take glasses off, play like, you can't <laughs> stop him. Man. Yeah. <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah, nice man. Fair play to him. But yeah, Carl, take the stage, mate. So Robbie, just talking about your boy there, when yeah. he turns over, mm-hmm. are you are you gonna train him, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless so you've someone else. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think he's happy with me. How, how's that going to be for you? Because obviously, like, you, you know, like Jack said, you've trained plenty of fighters. You've worked with some some very good names, to be fair. are you? Is it going to be hard for, you know, leaning on them that, that canvas, looking in the ring and watching your boy float around at pro? Is that going to be hard? Or have you just sort of kind of stay in that mindset of he's another no, fighter? No, I'm all right now. I mean, when I first started, like, I'd get a bit uh, apprehensive. You know, like, I said, when I used to fight, like, I was never one to suffer nerves. But when my fighters fight, I do get nervous. But when when Rob fights now, he knows how to hold himself. He can hold his shot if he needs to. Defensively, he's, he's very, very good. And he hits hard as well. Like, if he wants to tell you to, you know, back up a bit, you know, he's more than capable of doing that. So, I, yeah, I, I don't mind now. I'm, I'm quite easy. We've traveled around so much fighting. Is, is is no problem for me now. I mean, you know, you hear a lot of these fighters now, like Ricky Hatton speaks about it, Nigel Ben speaks about it. But was you one of them them guys when you was fighting and you had your boy? Was it a case of did you ever get asked, you've had a son, do you want your son to fight? Or was that never brought to you, that question? Yeah, no, I've asked, I was always asked that question. Um, I've always said, like, any of my kids, I would never push them into boxing. I would like them to do it for the, the fitness, the discipline. Um, but then it's up to them if they want to pursue it. Um, Rob was boxing for a little while. Then I started fighting again myself. So then he was left his mum to take him. And then he just went off it then for years. And then when I got the gym in South Harrow, he then started coming back just to mess about. And he just fell back in love with it. And he's, he's been training ever since, nonstop. That's good. I mean, obviously, oh, I love boxing. If I had a dad that boxed, I would have probably done it. But with a nose like this, I would have probably lasted about 44 <laughs> seconds and been done. Yeah, but, yeah. Robbie, you, you won't remember, I actually met you once. So when you trained Mitchell, I was actually at Mitchell's last fight in Bracknell. And yeah. I spoke to you outside. You, you yeah. ain't going to remember this. You meet thousands of people. Do you know what I mean? I, I can't and, remember what I yesterday. Yeah, like, so if I turn to the there. side, you'll remember yeah. me because you'll see the nose. But um, <laughs> oh, I just remember speaking to you. I said this to Jack before, just how calm you were. You know, fighters always moan. The mm. worst question on fight week is how are you feeling? Yeah. You know? And I now know that because when I work with fighters myself, we got, how are you feeling? Stop asking that. I delete the message. But yeah. how do you, on fight week, you know, if you sense that a fighter is anxious, say you've got Jack, Mm-hmm. And since he's a bit stressed, what do you do as a trainer to just keep them on that level of just concentrate on the fight? Because just saying it's easy, but how do you do that as a trainer to make sure that they are just concentrating on the fight? Well, all my fighters know, like, you, you keep it in your mind while you're training, you know, so you've got something to um, uh, fuel yourself for training, but not to the point of burnout. And, like, as we always say, like, fight night as well. You don't need to be thinking, thinking, thinking the fight. Like, so you've already fought the fight in your head. I don't know, twenty times before you you step into the ring. My my fighters don't switch on until you know we start uh, wrapping the hands, getting ready, 
to avoid burning out mentally and fatiguing yourself. Um, and it all depends on the, the fighter, you know, everyone's different. Uh, you've got to understand your fighter, you know, what gets them going, you know, when they're down, when they need picking up. Um, and for me, not to be the same, you know, I might be calm, but then my fighter needs revving up a little bit, so I, I have to change myself. Um, it's a bit of give and take, you know, understanding your fighter, uh, what they need, uh, at what time, you know, I'm, I'm calm, but sometimes I've got to rear up on you a little bit to, to fire you up. If you're a Laxy Daisy, there's no point me, like, just cool, calm and collected, like, talking to you like this. You know, I've, I've got to fire you up, so then I, I've got to adjust as well. I suppose, you know, it's no good having a fighter that's just sat there picking their nails 20 minutes for a fight and you're running around the chamber going, fight, 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 and they're just not up for it. Mm. Yeah, it's, yeah. And it's like you say, look, I speak to Jack about it. Jack, you know, Jack loves his music, and I suspected that Jack would. I remember before the Paul Roberts fight, uh, mm. Odd, one of his sponsors, one of my good friends, his little son was there. And Jack, mm. it can't have been any more than 20 minutes before your fight, can it? Mm. And I see Terry, Jack's uh, now fiance, and I said, Oh, Stevie's here. She went, oh, I'll go and get him. And I was like, No, like Christ, he's going to be preparing. And then all mm. of a sudden, literally about 15 minutes before the ring walks, Jack's just come out into the crowd. And come and met this kid. So I can see it means something. I mean, I would be that fighter that I would need to just have music playing and just zone myself out. Yeah. You know, but like you say, I suppose it is right. You've got to kind of put yourself towards how the fighter is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We we spoke about with you like your camps and sparring and stuff and working Van and Bruce. Mm-hmm. Obviously, a lot of people don't like to answer this question, but who was the best person you shared a ring with in sparring? Like where you got in there and thought. This is going to be hard. <laughs> I don't know because you got to remember, I was professional for like sixteen years, mm. and I, I really did get get about like aspiring all sorts. Um, so who hit the hardest? I, I can tell you that without thinking about it. I think I, I could know. I, I had a friend who started boxing with me, uh, mm. Darren Evans. And I still say to this day, pound for pound, he's the biggest punch in, uh, well, pound for pound that I've <laughs> ever been in with. I've really? seen it rob people's souls. It's like the power, it hit you, your head just feels hollow. Jeez. And what you weight said was he? Go on, Jack, sorry. What weight was he? He was a middleweight. Oh, middleweight. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so when you spar like that, obviously... Is it that you get hit once? I'll be, I have no idea. And obviously, Jack, this is a question for you as well. But when you first spar someone brand new and you get hit like that, what is it? Is it like, shit, like, I'm three weeks out and this geezer's is going to hurt me? Or is it right now it's switch on? How do you go with that, Jack? Uh, th- mate, to me, I just think I've always had a good, like, poker face. And, like, you know, I just try not to show any emotion or any weakness and just kind of crack on with it. Yeah, one thing with Jack, I will say this is whether like I remember about two weeks out when we was down in Essex and you had you done three rounds. I think you did a bit of skipping before you did 10 rounds with Jordan and then Kieran had you do six rounds on the bag or four rounds on the bag. Mm. And you could not tell the difference in Jack from when he walked in the gym in his mm. white fluffy jacket to when he's just done like 14 rounds. And I'm standing yeah. there and I, I even say it to you, Jack, then I? I say, like, how are you not throwing up? Like, why are you not laying on the floor? Do you know mm. what I mean? And I have seen you spar, and I can vouch that, you know, you, you mate, you, well, Rob, you know, this man can take a shot. Just yeah, like, yeah. The way he's at, it's ridiculous. Yeah, anyone. Yeah. And this is what, with the point, when he got cut, like, I was standing there, like, I was at the top of your call, like, oh, my God, he's cut. And this, mm. this guy just doesn't care. Like, it's like, <laughs> Jack, like, come on, man. But, Rob, same question to you, mate. Uh, about sparring? Yeah. Like, when someone that's hit hard, how do you deal you, with it? Listen, you're going to shower. You're going to get wet. Mm-hmm. Like you, you just deal with it. If you mm-hmm. tell if you if you tell them to fight and sign it aside, what are you gonna do? You, you got to get the job done still. Yeah. So it. it's, it's if someone hits you hard, it's like yeah, you, you can punch. Well, let's go. It's like we, we're boxers. I mean, well, I, I've seen especially down like like I say with Jack and especially down the edge gym, you see a lot of good sparring down there and. Now, you've had some very good spars and you're starting sparring this week. I'm looking forward to that. Mm. But how, with in regards to camp with you, Robbie, mm-hmm. what was the, the part of camp you look forward to? I used to love sparring. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that is always my favourite thing. Like, even when I wasn't boxing, I'd go to gym solely to spa. That's crazy, isn't it? Jack, mm. Obviously, with, it's, it, I mean, I watch sparring and I just think it's, it's no different to a fight. But mm. then you get the tech sparring, which Jack, you said about yesterday, which is where you work on stuff. So I'm actually looking forward to seeing that this week. Did When you sparred Groves, how was he to, to work with? Because he, mate, I still stand to it. This day. I think that man had the best jab in boxing. Yeah, yeah. What was that like? Yeah, George, George is very good, and he never he never used to open up with me, um, like going mad. Um, so it, it it was it wasn't like a, a all out spa. Mm. He he. I mean he he. I think he would have along with Kevin Mitchell if he hadn't won that world title against Chudenov. I think him and Kevin Mitchell, and I think we could all agree on this, would be the best British fighters to have not won a world title. Yeah, yeah. Kevin Mitchell actually fought last weekend at York Hall. Did you ever have you seen that? No. Kevin Mitchell? Yeah, he fought in a charity fight at York Hall. Oh, he did he? Nice. blue and gold uh, shorts on. Uh, but one more for me, Robbie. Can, so I can, don't know on, on that, is like, I, I've never been one for technical sparring. Mm. Like, I, I used to spar, spar five days a week, and I believe that's how I hone my skills, you know, different weights, you know, people punching hard, people punching fast. And I was able to manoeuvre myself around under, like, constant pressure because I wasn't led into full sense of security. Like, I can practice this because we're not going hard. And then when I go into fight, all of a sudden, bang, someone's hitting hard and, oh, like, I'm out of my comfort zone. i done it the hard way in sparring. So when I was fighting, you know, I could do it comfortably. Mm. Did you say five days a week? Yeah, as an amateur, yeah. Oh, as an amateur. I was going to say, Christ, you yeah. imagine that as a pro now, Jack. Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah. Well, but I, I got think one more. Buddy years as a pro, he used to spar five days a week as well. Oh, wow. Jesus Christ. Oh, I can't watch one spar a week, let alone watch five, being in there. <laughs> I'm Jesus wept. Um, but obviously, Robbie, you're close with Jack. Um, I don't know if you see, see the fight in, uh, I'm going to get this wrong again, March the 12th. Yeah. Um, it was an absolute war, mate. Personally, for me, I had Jack winning the fight. Obviously, got cut mm -hmm. badly early. Um, mm -hmm. You know Jack well. What mm -hmm. What can you – what would – if you could say anything to Jack now, as a friend, as a as a, as a a trainer, to give him that bit of oomph for – what he don't need the oomph, but what you can give him for July the 23rd, mm -hmm. take the stage. All right. The, my whole thing is to – is boxing. Hit and not get hit. So – I say, do what you've done in the fir first fight, but when you finish, don't be there to get hit after. Mm. Make it clear cut. Thanks, Robbie. Believe, believe <laughs> you can do it, and uh, you will, Jackie. I know. Thanks, mate. <laughs> so, just I've got one more question for you, Rob. Um, obviously, Carl was just mentioning Kevin Mitchell coming back for a charity fight, and I remember not too long ago, you called out Oscar De La Hoya for mm. a charity boxing match. I just didn't want to know. smoke, Jackie. Uh, I was just going to say, did you ever hear anything back from him? <laughs> nah, nah. I, I spoke to um, uh, uh, not not the matchmaker. Um, I think he's the manager hmm. who works with Oscar. He said he put my name forward, but I didn't hear anything. I didn't expect to. I just yeah. tried my luck. He it would be lovely you know. like, to share a ring with him, but... yeah. I swear he didn't even have that charity fight anyway. No, he didn't. He pulled no, out. He, he, got, he, he got COVID, so you say. COVID, yeah, it starts with C. That's what he was on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah but if, there, if, there's, if there's anyone else who's up for it, I, yeah, I'll be up for not? it. I, I whip myself back into shape. Yeah, why not, Robbie? Yeah, yeah <laughs> give, give it a good go. How old are you, Robbie, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I'm almost 42. Oh, you look 32. You can get that. <laughs> So, I'll yeah. shave my beard off, I will. I look <laughs> so, yeah, I think that is it, lad. So, I think we'll wrap it up there. Robbie, thank you so much for joining nah, us. No, thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Anytime, mate. So, and yeah, best of luck, Jackie. You, you do the business, no doubt. Thanks, Robbie, mate. I appreciate it. So, yeah, people, that's all for today. Join us next week for another exciting episode of Let the Punk Talk. Peace.